Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this first India Materials uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, uh, well, all the India Materials team, we really hope that uh, all the participants and their families are healthy during this uh, difficult period for, for everyone. So, well, as you know, in the Materials Institute uh, launched today the first episode of a scientific technological webinar series given by its uh, principal investigators. The aim of these uh, webinars uh, is to disseminate the knowledge we have acquired through the years in order to study, develop, and process better materials that can contribute to solutions to societal challenges. In this first webinar, uh, Professor Jose Manuel Torralba will talk about powder metallurgy, an opportunity to approach the materials challenges. And regarding the, the structure of this of the webinar, uh, is going to be a, a organized in two main parts. The first one is obviously the most important one, will be the, uh, the, the talk of uh, Professor Torralba more or less will last 40 45 minutes approximately and and then we will have another 15 20 minutes for uh, open questions so uh, being said that i would like to uh, and before starting the the webinar i would like to introduce uh, today's speaker as everyone knows uh, is uh, professor jose manuel torralba is a he is a full professor of material science and engineering at the University Carlos III of Madrid and also senior researcher at India Materials Institute, where he is uh, currently leading the solid state processing R&D group. And a short summary of his long uh, career and successful career, uh, I would like to, to mention that uh, well, he has been head of the material science and engineering department uh, at the Carlos University uh, of Madrid in 1999 and 2000. He was also vice rector for academic uh, infrastructures uh, at the same university from 2000 to 2004. He was also vice rector for research and innovation at the Carlos III University of Madrid as well from 2004 to 2006. Deputy director of the Institute in their materials from 2009 and 2015 and then from July 2015 till August 2019, he was the general director for universities, research, and higher artistic schools of the Madrid regional government. Uh, his main scientific te technical field of interest is powder metallurgy. He has published more than 500 scientific papers, 250 of them in the GCR index with more than 5,000 citations. And he has supervised 29 PhD theses and 90 diploma theses. He has participated in more than 70 international scientific committees of international conferences and being chairman of seven of them, including AMTP 2001 and AMTP 2015. Has been involved in 35 competitive projects in regional, national, and international frameworks, being main researcher in 25 of them. Has managed a, a, a uh, several research grants and contracts with industries, including the Hoganas Chair in Powder Metallurgy. And he is regional editor for Europe of Journal of Materials Processing Technology and Metals. And he is also editor in chief, co editor of Powder Metallurgy from 2009 to 2015, uh, academic supervisor of the uh, EEPMA Summer School. And I, 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 I could actually add a lot more things about the uh, successful career of, of, of Professor Torralba, but uh, well, what we want to really hear today is his uh, technical uh, expertise and, and uh, all the things that he has to, to tell us about the uh, powder metallurgy. So with this, I would like to give the word to Professor Torralba. So please, uh, whenever you want. Okay, Miguel Angel, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And let me just to start to give the thank you, thank you to the people to, who has joined to us today. I hope that this, with this uh, webinar, we will help to the people in this difficult moment that we are living in, in, in Spain and in other countries. And I hope you will enjoy this, this talk. And um, also, I want to say that this is a general 
is a, is a, is a talk structure in order to have a divulgative uh, objective. So for those of you that they have seen you are present, uh, there are a lot of experts in powder metallurgy, so maybe some parts of my talk is well known for you. So I, ho I hope don't boring you too much and to, to give you some new ideas and open new windows. Anyway, also I want to thank to India to be the first in this uh, webinar series that I think is a very nice idea. And for me, it's really an honor to, to, to start with this series. And especially because I'm going to talk about powder metallurgy as an opportunity to approach uh, the material challenge, because powder metallurgy has been the core of my, my activity, my professor and researcher, and I am really happy to talk about this, this topic. So let me start just defining what is powder metallurgy, because uh, from the beginning, we have to say that powder for, is a powder forming, is a materials forming technology, which is based in the production of uh, composites, ceramics, and metallic parts. When we mention uh, the word metallurgy, we are thinking, especially in metals, but uh, metallic powders can be mixed with ceramic or other kind of powders. And with this technology, we go from the powder to the part uh, through a process in which in the core part is the sintering process, which is the part in which we get the more percentage of the final properties of the material. We have different fields of application for powder metallurgy. The first one is the most known, is the application in which we have a high level of cost savings. In this case, we are developing cheap materials, cheap parts. That means large, usually large manufacturing series, complex shapes, small size parts, but uh, one characteristic of this field of application is that usually the properties that we have at the end of the process are not so good as in another alternative uh, processing methods. So the main value of this uh, field of application of powder metallurgy usually is the cost. Second, one, one example of this, uh, of this uh, field of application is the synchronizer hub. Synchronizer hub is a very interesting part. It's part of the transmission of uh, one conventional uh, car. And uh, in, one, in each transmission, you have at least five of these synchronizer hubs. And this part usually uh, were made in the past, maybe 20 or 15, more than 15, 20 years ago, it was made by forging and machining. And this part, by this alternative method, by forging and machining, the cost to develop this part is in the order of 40, 50 percent more than by powder metallurgy. By powder metallurgy, you can develop the part with enough properties to fulfill the requirements of the transmission of the car and at much lower price. If we go to the second field of application, it's the completely opposite field of application. In this case, through powder metallurgy, we can produce parts with much better properties than any other alternative manufacturing process. Why? Because powder metallurgy can assure, by different ways, a, good, uh, a better uh, microstructural control, a better chemical control of the composition, no segregations, and a, a lot of different things that can improve a lot the properties. In that case, powder metallurgy is the best way to obtain uh, one determined, determined uh, part. How one example of this uh, field of application is high speed steels. High speed steels can be produced by different ways, by casting, forging, of course, uh, the machining and so on. On the left, we have a typical forge uh, high speed steels. If you see the microstructure, you can see in a matrix of iron, of uh, iron based material, you have a lot of uh, black, uh, black uh, in the black, in the, sorry, the, the white part of the microstructure are the, the dispersed carbides. As after forging, we have a, a, a directionality of these carbides. The size of the carbides are really high. And if you compare on the right with the powder metallurgy microstructure, here on the right, you have much lower size of the carbides, much better distributed without any, uh, any directionality of the, of the carbides. And the, all these microstructural features allows that this kind of high speed steel produced by uh, powder metallurgy is much better in properties than any other produced by forging or other alternative. So this is the case of the second niche, the second field of application. And we can go to the third one. The third one is uh, the, the captive way. We, this, in this way, powder metallurgy, we can say that this is the unique way to produce one specific part, one specific material. So in that sense, 
there is no other alternative. It's not a matter of price, it's not a matter of properties, it's just a matter of opportunity. It's the unique way to obtain one specific part. And we have one example of this uh, also here. It's the cemented carbides. This microstructure that we have on the, on the screen, you have seen a matrix of cobalt with the reinforcement of uh, tungsten carbide. And we have this specific microstructure. And with this specific microstructure, we have some specific properties that allow this material to have the main part in the market for the cutting materials in the world. That means that other metallurgy can produce this specific microstructure. You can, of course, you can take cobalt and uh, tungsten and carbon and cast it and to have a material produced by casting or other alternatives, but never you will have such a specific microstructure that can allow to us to have a good cutting uh, performance. So this is one example in which powder metallurgy is the unique way to produce one specific material. Of course, we can find some um, applications in which we can combine the three fields of application. We have some applications in which you can, uh, by powder metallurgy, you produce the part at lower price. This is the unique way to produce some specific uh, parts. And uh, by powder metallurgy, you produce the better material that can be obtained uh, for the for some specific application. And there is one example, which is, is quite uh, uh, well known, which is the self-lubricating beatings. The self-lubricating beatings, the unique way to produce this kind of material is by powder metallurgy, because you have a porous material with some specific porosity with some properties. Uh, the way to produce that is press and sinter, which is the most cheaper way to produce such a kind of parts. And uh, by powder metallurgy, you can get the better possible properties for or this specific application. So this is the ideal application in powder metallurgy. If we go to the conventional press and sinter method, which is the 90% maybe of the parts produced in the world by powder metallurgy, why we have cheaper, uh, cheaper prices? Why we, why we have a cost-effective um, production method? The main reason is that we use in the order of 95% of the, of the raw material. We don't have any losses in material or a few losses and we spend the lower uh, amount of energy to produce a final uh, a finished part. If we compare it with casting or extrusion or forging or machining. So we are combining a low, a low cost of in energy with a high level of raw material utilization. In that way, we used to have uh, lower prices. And what we have as, 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 uh, in, in the negative part of this, of this kind of uh, production method that use, we use to produce part with a lot of porosity and porosity decreases a lot most of the properties. Of course, uh, the tensile features are decreasing in a linear way, but if we go to properties linked to the ductility of the material, such as elongation or impact strength, we will decrease in an, in an exponential way the properties. Just with 5% of porosity in a part, we can decrease more than 50% of the final property of the material. So that, that is the typical uh, conventional powder metallurgy in which we have a low cost part with enough properties for the application, but with uh, much worse properties than the conventional uh, ingot metallurgy or workable metallurgy. So, in general, if we want to compare powder metallurgy with the conventional plastic deformation methods, in plastic deformation methods, we have a simulation of a microstructure. Here you have a texture material, usually, uh, usually without any porosity, with low level of defects but with a texture microstructure. If we go to powder metallurgy, we have, uh, here we have the, these uh, black dots simulating the porosity, but by conventional powder metallurgy, by press and sintering, we have enough performance to, the, to fulfill the application that we are looking for, but we have a lot of porosity. That means lower level of properties than in the conventional plastic deformation process. So we can compare on the left, the typical uh, microstructure that we can have in a plastic deformation process, and on the right, the conventional uh, powder metallurgy uh, microstructure uh, obtained by press and sintering. But, of course, uh, as during this lecture, I will try to, to show you some methods in which we can get uh, lower level of porosity using powder metallurgy. We can go from this situation to that one in which we have a non textured microstructure but without porosity. Or even we can get microstructures with uh, uh, a grain size much more reduced than the conventional, uh, even uh, forging material or conventional powder metallurgy materials. So that means on the right, we will have 
the best, the best material that we can be obtained because we have non-textile material with no defect, with no, with any def defects and with any uh, level of porosity. Of course, uh, of course, we can uh, we can increase the the performance in that way, but also we will increase the cost. So, power, conventional powder metallurgy used to be. Uh, represented in maps like this, in which we can represent the strength against the dimensional tolerance, because the dimensional tolerance is one of the advantages of the conventional powder metallurgy. But the, the level of properties in, in between the lower level till the high level is highly linked to the way in which we obtain the powder metallurgy part. If we go to press and sintering, we will have the materials in this side of the map, in which we have high level of dimensional tolerance, but low level of strength. If we increase the processing methods and we, and we go to lower level of porosity, we move in this direction and even we can reach high level of strength with medium poor uh, dimensional tolerances, but uh, these materials use, can, can compete with any other material in other alternative uh, processing techniques. So in this lecture, I will try to show you some ways in which we can improve the properties of the, powder, of the conventional powder metallurgy materials by different ways. I don't have time to, to go through in detail with, from, through all of them, but I will try to put some examples regarding how we can work on the microstructure and in that sense we can act over different, uh, different parts of the processing method in order to uh, produce better properties. Uh, we have another way to increase the properties is just increasing the density from high levels of green density. We don't have time to talk about that, but it's another interesting uh, way. Of course, we can increase the properties by sintering activation by different ways. I will, I will put some examples in this, in this field. And of course, today we have another completely field, new field, which is really interesting, which are the additive technologies. So re regarding the first of the, of the topics is uh, we can act over the Dalloyan system. Just to show you one example. Here we have the one steel, one conventional PM steel with nickel, copper, moly, and graphite and with some specific conditions in that in that in that uh, in this this condition are 11 1120 degrees at uh, uh, furnace co uh, cooling at the furnace and then tempered and you see that we can have three completely different sorry this is uh, this is the, the fixed uh, telephone the three completely different uh, microstructures and depending on the microstructure we will have different properties and these microstructures can be obtained depending of the way in which we treat the powders, the original powders, so hybrid alloys or diffusion alloying powders or fully pre alloyed powders. If we go to the properties, you see here, and we can represent the tensile strength in, as, 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 as function of the alloying elements, and with the same level of alloying elements, for instance, you can go to 4% or 6%, you can have different levels of tensile strength just changing the way in which you use the powders before starting the process. If you use mixed powder, you go to the lower level of properties, you can go to diffusion bonded powders and you increase the properties, you can go to diffusion powders and pre alloyed powders and you increase the properties and you can go to fully pre alloyed powders and you can get the best level of properties. So just acting on the over the alloying system, you can change the microstructure and changing the microstructure, you can change the properties. We can act, powder metallurgy is a good way to act over the grain side and, and modifying the grain side, you can get much better, much better properties. One way, of course, is mechanical alloying. This one processing is one way to produce uh, powders in which you can get, you see on the right, this is a mechanical alloyed intermetallic obtained by mixing and um, 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 milling at high energy uh, powders from uh, nickel and aluminum. And at the end, you can get a, a microstructure in the powder in which you have a grain side much lower than any other possibility uh, of, uh, of processing. Of course, you have also the rapid solidification methods in which you put in contact of, uh, of melt bath with the wheel, which is a very low temperature. And then the solidification uh, speed is, is in the order of 10,000, even higher degrees per second. In that, in that case, you are getting uh, in that case, fibers that can be uh, converted uh, through milling in powders uh, with uh, microstructure really fine, and sometimes even amorphous microstructures. So that can, in that way, you can obtain powders that can be used to develop really, really advanced materials. Let's go to the, to the third group of, uh, of 
method to improve the properties is uh, by cinder activation. We have different ways to activate the cindering process. Of course, liquid phase cindering is one of those uh, methods, uh, but in that case, we we will start to talk about the couple of different of different ways. One is to apply pressure and temperature at the same time. This is one of the most standard methods to, to produce advanced materials in the last decades, in the last maybe 10, 20, 30 years, is hot isostatic pressing. By hot isostatic pressing, you put powders inside the can and you apply the pressure to the gas in this can and you can get at the end a fully dense material with a very homogeneous microstructure and uh, of course, very good properties because you can control very well the chemistry of the powder and you can control very well the microstructure of the final the final material. The problem of hot isostatic pressing is the price because you need a very very expensive equipment just to perform the press and send the press and the sintering at the same time. You have usually to can the powders inside the can and this is a, this increases a lot the price of this this method. Another important thing in hot is depressing that usually you need a long period of time to reach the good properties at the end of the process. You need sometimes uh, in the dual time that you need to reach these uh, properties is in the order of hours, uh, two, three, four hours. So that, that means it's a long, long uh, process that usually make it uh, quite expensive. And in terms of the microstructure, one of the problems of hot is depressing if you need uh, so long times to, to reach the correct microstructure, of course, if you see on the left, you have a, high, uh, a traditional uh, present cinder uh, stainless steel in which you see the microstructure with a lot of porosity. After heaping, you get a fully dense material without any porosity. You can appreciate the porosity here, but uh, uh, due to the fact that you have need such a long time to reach this microstructure, usually the grain growth uh, more than the desire uh, that you are desiring. So anyway, in that case, hot isotic pressing has been used for many, many years to produce, for instance, high-speed steels, as you have here, these this, uh, this ingots of high-speed steels, with the best properties that you can reach in any other possibility or alternative method. You can uh, obtain biomaterials uh, from different superalloys or different uh, titanium-based alloys. You can obtain similar materials uh, welding uh, one base material with one co with one composite for instance or blades for the uh, for the uh, for the airplanes or cemented carbides for cutting applications or any much many other uh, applications it's really one of the methods to obtain advanced materials in the last 20 30 years so we have another ways to, to, to improve the properties in powder metallurgy. One is try to inhibit, try to inhibit it, the grain growth during sintering. There is one method in which you can inhibit the, the grain weight with its microwave furnace, with the microwave sintering. Uh, microwave sintering was applied for ceramics uh, before the, 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 the 2000 year, but from 2000 year, it was developed methods to, to sintering in microwave furnaces, even metals. Uh, microwave sinterings can, can reach very high temperatures in a very short time. So that means that the dual time for the sinter is not so high and you avoid the grain growth and you can reach uh, good microstructures by, with very fine grains without uh, not so much problem with this technology. But the most extended in the last times uh, method to inhibit the grain growth and applying at the same time pressure and, temper and temperature is the so-called Fill assisted methods. Uh, the most, the most uh, well known is spar plasma sintering. The spar plasma sintering, you put the powder in a die uh, and you apply the, the pressure uh, uh, with uh, an upper and a lower punch. Usually, we, we, have, we have to use in order to allow the current, the current uh, passing through the powder uh, uh, dies and punches uh, of graphite. And we are applying temperature to, the, uh, to apply a, a current through the powder. And so by Joule effect, we are heating the powders in a very fast way, and we can reach the sintering temperature in a fast way, and we don't need so uh, long periods to reach the full density in this material. Uh, as you can see in this typical, uh, typical cycle, uh, you can reach in the order of uh, 12, 50 degrees in a very short time of time, and the dwell time for reaching the, the, the best uh, properties in this material the, to, to have full density, is in the order of 10, 15, 20 minutes. 
So if you compare with hot, hot isostatic pressing, in which you need more than two or three hours sometimes to reach the full density, at the end you are having a, a way to get, uh, let's say, advanced materials, but uh, controlling much better the microstructure, controlling much better the grain size uh, with this, such a kind of methods. But one of the negative things of uh, spark plasma sintering and that technique that usually was established that the shape is just a cylinder, it's just uh, a blank that should be machined later in order to get the parts. But recently, there is some work in which, uh, thanks to modeling, thanks to the, 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 the computational modeling of all the process, you can develop uh, dice and, and punches that can optimize the current uh, passing through the powder, and you can get directly uh, the shape of uh, a turbine blade, and you can directly obtain the final part uh, by a spark plasma sintering. So this could reduce much a lot the price of this kind of, of methodology. And just to, to, to show some of the versatility, let's say, of the powder metallurgy, is that having the same material, exactly the same material, the same powder, with uh, just uh, the same conditions, you can get completely different microstructure using different uh, powder metallurgy technologies. In this case, this is a work from Rocío Muñoz, Dr. Muñoz, on the left, you have, uh, with uh, one titanium aluminite powder, uh, a completely different microstructure, a granular microstructure, a different even faces present on the microstructure, than on the right, with the spark plasma sintering, which we, can, we have reached the, the, dual, uh, uh, the dual part of the, of the process in, much, in a much faster way, and at the end, you have a um, better proper microstructure for, for the final application for this titanium aluminite. But there is another example in which powder metallurgy has different ways to reach more or less the same material. Here we have a high speed steel, this is produced by Paulo Alvaredo and other authors, in which you see on the left uh, one material, which is a composite, uh, uh, an iron based composite with titanium carbonitrides, just for cutting applications. You can get this microstructure on the left by press and sintering, but you have to reach. 700 megapascal in pressing and 12 and 1400 degrees, sorry, 1400 degrees in dwell time of 16 minutes to reach this microstructure. By spark plasma sintering at much lower temperature and uh, lower pressure and just 10 minutes, you can reach a much better microstructure with more refined grain, but uh, by for the same application with much uh, better properties. And, and there is another example. This is one example in which you can compare one high speed steel on the left produced by hot isostatic pressing and on the right metal injection molding. You can see more or less the same microstructure by, by different routes. So that means powder metallurgy offer a lot of different possibilities to get at the end one uh, suitable microstructure for one specific application. And let's go to the fashion of the last times, which is additive, additive technology. With additive technologies in metals, we can reach at the end a customized material, a customized part for one specific application in a very short time. And usually we can reach good properties if we uh, optimize the process in a good way. But uh, additive, yeah, even additive technologies has different possibilities, like, like in the other powder metallurgy technologies. In, 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 in ID manufacturing, we have in principle three main ways to reach the final pass. One are the, the so-called powder bed systems in which we have a bed in which we put the powder, the, uh, the beam, the laser beam acts on the surface and with this retractable platform we can grow the part from the bottom, from the top to the bottom. Uh, in this case, the, the main different thing regarding the other additive manufacturing methods is that we need for sure uh, fully pre alloyed powders with very well controlled, uh, well controlled microstructure and well controlled in order to assure a good melting on, on, the, on the upper part in which we are applying the, 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 the beam of the laser beam. Uh, we have another alternative, which is the so-called powder feed system. The advantage of powder feed systems in this case is that we can use mix of powders. We, can, we have different hoppers. We, we, can, uh, we can feed the powders by different hoppers and we can have different uh, kind of powders and we don't need to use a fully pre powder always. Of course, we can use fully pre powders also. Here, we have a different concept in order how we can build the part because here we have a, a bottom-up method, but at the end we have also different problems. 
And we have a third way to obtain uh, materials by adding manufacturing of metals, is the so-called binder removal system. In this case, we are printing in a similar way that the, we print the, the parts in, in 3D printing for polymers, but in this case, we, we need a feedstock, we need a mix of polymer and metals in order to have a good printing method. Uh, in this case, once we have the printed part, we need to remove the, the, the binder. Sometimes the, the amount of the binder is not so high, like in, for instance, in, in the HP method, HP uh, method in which we have a, a, a very small amount of binder, but there is other methods in which the amount of binder is much higher. Once we have removed the binder, we have to move the part to a sintering furnace and then to reach the final properties after a sintering process, a conventional sintering process. So, by added manufacturing, as you can imagine, you have the possibility to, to, to tailor the, the porosity in different shapes and in different kinds of materials. You can get uh, parts for uh, very advanced materials for aerospace or for uh, airplanes. And of course, it has a lot of applications in uh, biomaterials for implants and for a lot of uh, applications in bio biomaterials. So this, this, uh, this is a, a really a revolution because you can customize the part and you can customize the method to produce the final part with a very specific properties for some specific application in a very short time. This is one of the advantages. So in powder metallurgy, uh, most of the people know the powder metallurgy in which we have porous material that you can have, you have here, but uh, just modifying the allergen system, you can go to different microstructure and even you can control the grain site by methods like we have seen, like mechanical alloying or rapid solidification techniques. But also with powder metallurgy, you can reach to high green density or by cinder activation, you can reach near full density materials. Here, I can, I can draw here some porosity, but this porosity is really, really small. Even sometimes it's difficult to be detected by a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, characterization methods. Of course, you can apply pressure and temperature you can inhibit the grain growth as with methods, as I mentioned, like uh, microwave sintering or spark plasma sintering. And today we have a last way to, to full dense to obtain full dense material with additive technology. So we can say that powder metallurgy can offer a lot of opportunities to approach the so-called materials challenge, as is the name of this of this lecture. So I will focus on two uh, two uh, two different material challenges. In the, in the industry and in the, in, the, in the new technologies. One is the high temperature challenge. Um, the high temperature challenge is really important in some industries, but maybe the main battle, battle war that we have in the high temperature challenge is the, in the airplanes. In the airplanes, especially in the engines. In the engines, you can find many kinds of materials, titanium-based materials, nickel, steels, even uh, aluminum, aluminides, and even uh, ceramic composites in which the battle for to reach a, a space, a place to work is really, really hard. In that case, powder metallurgy offer um, a lot of possibilities. I have mentioned before the spark plasma sintering, which uh, through this technology, you can reach really uh, advanced materials with a very well controlled microstructure with, with highly suitable to compete with any other competitive alternative uh, uh, processing technology. Thanks in that case to the, to, the, to, to the combination of the technology with the modeling, in, the, in that case to design the dies and the, and the punches. But also the powder, powder metallurgy offer a lot of uh, challenge, a lot of opportunities in the development of, of new materials uh, because the, the way in which we produce the alloys allows to us to do things that are not possible to do in alternative technologies. In this case, we have this is the microstructure of the new cobalt uh, gamma gamma prime superalloy, in which we can reproduce the conventional superalloys, nickel based superalloys microstructures. And in this case, through powder metallurgy, we can reach much better properties than using alternative technology. This, this new superalloy was developed in 2004, 2005. And in the last year, we have been working through powder metallurgy in order to improve this alloy. In this case, here we have the results obtained for this alloy in conventional uh, cobalt, cobalt based uh, casting alloys, but also using uh, casting to this specific super alloy, 
But by powder metallurgy using fully atomized powder, we can improve much better the gel stress uh, as function of the temperature and even by addition of different alloying elements, by mixing the powders and by mechanical alloying through the atomized powder, we can also reach much better properties. But uh, in the last times, we, have, we are find, finding, finding a lot of new materials. One, this new material that has been developed in the last, let's say, 10 years is high entropy alloys. In high entropy alloys, if you see the correlation in between, between the GF strength and the temperature, this is a material that can compete much uh, with the wood uh, advantages with conven conventional inconel or uh, other nickel based super alloys, which we have here the, the behavior against the temperature. Here we have the, 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 the new, uh, let's say, high entropy alloys. So that's, we have moving the curves in this way, in which we have much better behavior with the temperature. But these high entropy alloys, of course, can be produced by ingot casting, but also by powder metallurgy. But by powder metallurgy, we can do things that are not possible to do with conventional ingot casting. For instance, the development of the so-called ODS high entropy alloys, in which we can disperse we can disperse oxides in the high entropy alloy uh, through spark plasma sintering and other powder metallurgy technologies. We can reach these exceptional, uh, let's say, tensile features uh, in comparison with conventional ingot metallurgy uh, high entropy alloys. So we have another field. This is the field of the high temperature uh, challenge, but we have another field in which we have a real important challenge for material science, which is the functional materials challenge. And specifically, there is a lot of application in which uh, we can functionalize very well the properties of the final uh, material thanks to the powder metallurgy technologies. This is one example. This is courtesy of, uh, of Dr. Sofia Chipas from Carlos III University, in which you can see here we can combine a new material with a new technology. The new material is the max phase. Uh, Max phases, which is a new kind of materials in which we can, we can combine three kinds of uh, alloying elements, like, such as titanium, aluminum, and carbon, or titanium, silicon, and carbon, in which we can customize the porosity thanks to the space holder technology in powder metallurgy. On the left, you can see a fully dense material that can be obtained, but you can customize the porosity for different kinds of application in which we can obtain at the end porosity with a very well controlled size, in this case, between 800 and uh, 1 millimeter. So that means that through powder metallurgy, you can really develop material, but for some specific application, just uh, working, acting on the alloying, uh, alloying, uh, let's say the, allo the alloys that you are working with, but also with the technology. Here we have another example. In this case, is the development of uh, porous uh, magnesium scaffolds for bone growth, uh, in this case, by additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing is a fantastic technology that you can customize a lot of things. You can customize the level of porosity. You can customize the, uh, the let's say, the size of the strut in that case in, the scale, in the case of the scaffold. And even you can design how could be the strength and the elongation of each strut that you have in this, uh, in this specific uh, part. So for bio application, you have a, a completely new world thanks to the combination of the new materials with new technologies, in this case, based on powder metallurgy, in this case, additive manufacturing. And let's go to the last example, which is a very, in my opinion, amazing, amazing uh, example, which is, and this is, uh, this is thanks, to the, uh, thanks to the courtesy of, the, uh, of Dr. Pedro Martinez Seijas, uh, he's an oral and maxifacial, maxillofacial uh, surgeon. This uh, doctor, he can develop, this is made in Spain, fully made in Spain, he can develop uh, handy mandible custom made reconstruction with a bioactive uh, surface, especially developed for one specific person. And you can construct this, you can uh, design the, the, uh, the new uh, mandible by, by CAT systems, and then you can reproduce exactly what you need on the, on the patient by additive manufacturing, in this case, uh, metallic additive manufacturing. This is one example, but here we have another an amazing example in which you can reconstruct a fully mandible reconstruction uh, by additive manufacturing of metals. So we have seen that powder metallurgy is a real flexible technology that, that can produce uh, materials and new materials. There are advantages in terms of uh, produce these new materials because we can have 
of course, new technologies developed especially for, for these new materials, but you can control the microstructure much better than any other alternative uh, uh, production method. You can have much better grain site control, of course, much better chemical control, isotropy, among other advantages. Uh, there are a lot of PM techniques that allow to obtain uh, these uh, full materials. And today, with the additive manufacturing technologies, you can get a lot of final applications that can be really customized in a very short time. You can have in a very short time a mandible, you can have in a very short time a hip, you can have in a very short time one specific part to replace one fail that you can have in one advanced uh, process that you are uh, running in one specific application. So what we can offer from uh, the power metallurgy group in, in their materials? One interesting thing that we can offer is that we can really comprehensively develop new materials from the beginning till the final part. Uh, we can really develop the material from the beginning because we can combine one, uh, let's say, uh, important skill that we have in the Institute with the multi-scale modeling strategy from the atom to the final part, including the thermodynamic modeling of the material. Of course, once you have developed the, the, the you have designed the material, you can develop prototypes, in that case, by, by ingot metallurgy, ingot casting. And then you can test this, uh, this microstructure and you can reproduce the microstructure by different ways. And then you can fully develop the materials by powder root. And we are, we are talking materials, we are talking different kind of materials. Of course, super alloys, high entropy alloys, new generation of steels, biomaterials, and so And once you have designed the, part, the material, you can develop the powder by different routes, by mechanical alloying or atomizing. And of course, then once you have the powder, you can develop the part, you can develop the, the, the approach, the, the, the bulk material by techniques like by fill assisted hot pressing or meta injection molding, or of course, additive manufacturing. But another, uh, let's say, strong point of the Institute is the multi-scale characterization. In all the process from the beginning, from the ingot casting model till the final part produced by one specific technique, by, by powder metallurgy technique, you can test in all the steps uh, different problems that you can have in the development. Uh, you can, uh, you can uh, control the microstructures by X-ray tomography, and you can develop in situ tests to test very small parts or very small parts of, of the microstructure, or even to know, to have a good knowledge of some phases that you can detect before by ABBS uh, techniques in the, in the, in the, in the FIP microscope. So at the end, you can combine a lot of uh, techniques of characterization, a lot of techniques of multi-scale model in order to develop the, the materials, and of course, the technologies to produce the real, the real bull part in the process. So I think this is all. So now I think I have uh, fulfilled the time requirements that Miguel Angel uh, told me, about 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes. And now I completely open and thank you to your questions. Well, thank you very much, José Manuel. Thank you very much for, for, for the presentation and this uh, clear overview and 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 you i think you you gave a very nice and open uh, 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 talk about the different possibilities of uh, powder metallurgy and opening uh, new possibilities of these uh, the different technologies and and the processing and and, and post processing uh, techniques associated to to this uh, uh, methodology so well, this is uh, now time for, now we have uh, like 10, 15 minutes for questions. So anyone that would like to ask something to Professor uh, Toralba, please uh, write the, 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 the question uh, through the chat so I can read it or, or, or Professor, Professor Toralba can read it directly. But meanwhile, uh, the people or anyone is uh, actually writing any, any of the questions. I would like to make the first question, uh, uh, Jose Manuel. So you were talking about um, the high entropy alloys. So I, I, I know that this is, I mean, relatively quite new, but I would like to ask you, is how, how implemented is this, uh, this uh, in, in industry uh, nowadays? And, and now in the industry is completely uh, a new field. There are some industries that I am, I, I know that they are just uh, thinking about to, to test this kind of material. But today, today we are far, still far, a little bit far from the industry because high entropy alloys needs uh, 
not only technology needs a lot of physical metallurgy, it needs a lot of uh, knowledge uh, to the development of these materials. But they are really promising materials because when you are in the limit, when you are in the breakthrough of the, of the application, you need, sometimes you need to improve 10, 15, 20 degrees more in terms of high temperature, in terms of uh, some specific behavior in some specific fields. And in that case, you have to go to these new materials to, to, to break through, to, to change the things in this, in this such a specific application. And we are working very hard on that. And we are trying to compare some uh, high entropy alloys in, in, with conventional super alloys and with conventional uh, intermetallics in the field of high temperature applications. And I think that these are a really promising material in the future. Okay. And what about, uh, what about the cost? Do you have any... any, any yeah, cost, cost is uh, in some way a little bit higher, must be a little bit higher because you are using much more amount of uh, specific alloying elements. But you have to think that in, when you are fighting in this breakthrough, in this part of the, of the limit of the technology, sometimes cost is not the most important thing. Okay, so there is another question here. Well, the, a first general question that I, I, I read is about the presentation. Uh, well, the, the, um, the full seminar is going to be uh, published in our website and so everyone is going to have access to, to these uh, slides and, and, and the, the presentation. Uh, and also, well, actually you can go through the whole webinar if you want uh, anytime. It will be in our web page. And then there's another question here, uh, Jose Manuel, I think, uh, are the high entropy alloys processable using additive manufacturing. Is there any particular element that has a main role in these alloys? Yes, uh, there is. Uh, in fact, I am working in one review paper about high entropy alloys and additive manufacturing, and I hope to publish it uh, in a very short time. I hope so. Let's see. Uh, this, uh, this quarantine has been some time to, to reflect on this, these materials. High entropy alloys, there is in the last, in the last two, three years, there are, there, are, there are in the order of 50, 60 papers uh, regarding high entropy alloys and additive manufacturing. Of course, using Binder Jet methods, which is the, maybe the more uh, virgin way to produce high entropy alloys, I think it could be a very interesting uh, area because by Binder Jet, you will use at the end sintering in a very similar way that uh, other alternatives. But by less, selective less melting or, or even direct metal deposition, there are many, many people working on that. And there are two different approaches. Uh, when you are going to select the laser methods, you need uh, fully pre alloyed powders, which is not easy in high entropy alloys to find it. But in uh, direct metal deposition, you can mix the powders uh, by elemental mixing. So that means that you have a lot of opportunities to design the high entropy alloys. And there is, in, in, in additive manufacturing, most of, the, most of the people are using the so-called Cantor alloy. If you are in this field, you, you will know what is can the Cantor alloy. If Cantor was the first person who developed one of the high entropy alloys. It's uh, iron, cobalt, manganese, uh, nickel, chromium uh, a base alloy. And in that case, there is one element which is uh, playing a, a really interesting role, which is aluminium. Aluminium in the Cantor alloy used to be replacing the manganese or even other of the other five elements. And with the aluminium, you can tailor a lot the microstructure because usually the Cantor alloy is an FCC, it's an FCC uh, alloy. It's a completely fully FCC, a phase center cubic uh, alloy. But aluminium introduced the possibility to have a mix in the microstructure in between BCC and FCC. And that play that could play a very nice role in order to have good heat treatments in order to improve some specific uh, properties, especially for high temperature. So there is a, an interesting field uh, in this, uh, these, two, these two emerging technologies. By one side, additive manufacturing, and, and on the other side, the high entropy alloys as, as, as material. <coughs> Excellent, thank you, Jose Manuel. And another question here is, um, uh, do you think microwave sintering and SPS, uh, fast uh, sintering text, uh, can be commercialized in the future? Or do you think the oven, the oven companies already worked for large furnaces, but they failed? 
in, in the case of microwave sintering, I think uh, there is no so many companies uh, dealing for that uh, or uh, betting for that. So, but I think in the future, uh, when you have a way to, to reach good properties and good materials, at the end, at the end, uh, there will be someone who, who who try to do it at the industrial level. There is some some applications, but very small small application and very let's say a specific application but spark plasma sintering i think is, is a real situation they will go for sure in the industry in fact there are some aerospace industry that are working a lot with the spark plasma sintering process so in the case of microwave sintering i think we are a little bit far from the industry but the spark plasma sintering we are much more near in the industry because there are some companies which are now working and trying to develop things by spark plasma sintering Plasma sintering, in fact, is like at the beginning hot isostatic pressing. At the beginning hot isostatic pressing, the problem was the the, the size that, that, that it was not possible to produce near net shape uh, parts by hot isostatic pressing. By companies start to produce big ingots of hot isostatic pressing material. But we are trying to do in the industry now is to upscale at big scale uh, the spark plasma sintering in order to have big blanks that can be machined. And in that case, uh, now in Spain, we have even one, uh, the larger spark plasma sinter, uh, spark plasma sinter in, um, machine, which is in Oviedo, in uh, one center related to the, the Institute of Carmon, which is NanoCare, which is a spin-off spin company. They have the largest uh, spark plasma sinter in machine in Europe, and they can produce really big blanks that can be machined and, and used by some specific applications. Yeah. Okay, let me. So I don't know if there is any other more questions. I'm looking at the chat to see if there is any more questions. If well, if not, I I I had another uh, a last one question. Is that in your opinion, Jose Manuel? What do you think are the 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 the, the barriers that uh, nowadays have the additive manufacturing technologies uh, to be fully implemented in industry? And nowadays, or oh, the barriers, the, 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 what? Well, okay, one of the main barriers in some way are, is the powder development. Uh, the key point here is the powder. If you don't have good uh, powders to develop materials, to develop parts, uh, you have a, an, an important barrier there. Fortunately, there are now a lot of uh, new powder uh, manufacturers that are in, involved in developing a new powder, fully pre powders, especially fully pre powders, for the technology. This is one of the barriers. The mm -hmm. second one is the knowledge. I think there are a lot, that even today, there are a lot of people who is trying to go inside this technology without knowledge at all about the powder technology. And powder is the key point in the, in the, in the good development of the final part by additive manufacturing. Fortunately, this is, a, this is a thing that is now, I think most of the people have this, uh, this thing in mind that they have to know very well the powder that we are using before to put in the machine anything inside the machine. The, I think another important thing is to, um, to, get, to get knowledge about the process. The process has a lot of, uh, let's say, weak points still now. So we have a lot of knowledge to put inside the process, inside to, the, to, to, to solve the defects that we have when we are melting something uh, in a very fast way, with a very fast cooling way, and so you have a lot of things in the process that could be uh, improved. In that sense, the, in, in that sense, in that sense, the combination of the knowledge in, uh, about physical metallurgy of the process and modeling, the modeling can add a good uh, a key factor here because by modeling we can advance a lot of the problems that we can, we can reach in the in the additive manufacturing machine. So this combination could be a good uh, marriage in order to improve the properties at the end of the of the of the additive manufacturing process. Yeah, I I, I fully agree. Thank you very much. And and a very last uh, question uh, that uh, some of the participant one one participant made is, what about the design of a specific alloys for additive manufacturing by Calfat? For sure, for sure. I think today. Um, Anyone can develop anything in material science without uh, take the advantage, take the benefits of the thermodynamic, uh, let's say, software that we have available in the in the market. So through Calfa, through the thermodynamical uh, 
to the, to the, to the thermodynamical uh, method, I think is the first step to any development. Well, today it's unbelievable that anyone can use these, this, uh, let's say, tools that we have available to develop any kind of, the, of new material. So in my opinion, this is the first step of any new research hmm. in material science today, in, in powder technology. Of course, you can do the things by the old style fashion way in which you can test the powders and by trial, trial and error, you can reach uh, final uh, design of, of, of material. But today, having CALFAR, having uh, thermodynamical tools in order to develop the, the, the alloys, it's amazing that people don't use it. Yeah. So I, I encourage to, do, to, do, to use these techniques to, to develop new materials. Okay, so, uh, well, it's one o'clock now. There is one question, I think Rocio is talking on something, Rocio Muñoz from uh -huh. HHP regarding the Binder Jetting Technologies. I think regarding the scene paint, in, in Binder Jet, uh, I, I have mentioned before that uh, sintering is a key, is the key, is one of the key parts of the, of the development because at the end, after after printing the material, after print the material, at the end you have to sinter the material. So the combination of powder metallurgy, the conventional knowledge in powder metallurgy about sintering techniques and sintering process, and the printing, which is the in that case the, the, the special know-how that they have in, in fellow Packard. I think it's a good combination also in order to try to develop much better uh, the material. Yeah, I think also she was trying to clarify a question regarding what you meant by HP method and she was just clarifying uh, uh, through the chat that HP is a binder jetting based technology, metal jet HP technology. So yeah, yeah. yeah she was basically clarifying this to another uh, 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 attendee. Okay, so well thank you very much. I don't think uh, we have more time and uh, this is one o'clock. Uh, well, uh, Jose Manuel, thank you very much for the for this uh, webinar. I think it was uh, very, very illustrating, very um, uh, inspiring. And I think uh, at least you gave uh, an overview and, uh, of the different possibilities uh, of uh, powder metallurgy. And if anyone uh, uh, that uh, would like to get further uh, information, uh, please contact uh, Professor Torralba directly. Uh, you can find all the contact details uh, uh, through the webpage of uh, India Materials or the Carlos III University. And well, as I said, this, uh, this is the first seminar, uh, the, the first webinar. Uh, many other seminars will come uh, soon from India Materials. And well, uh, with this, I wish you that all of you and your families keep uh, healthy. Um, and well, thank you very much to, to everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Jose Manuel. Thank you, let me just to say thank you to everybody to, to be so patient with me, especially to those people who are experts in powder metallurgy that maybe some of the things that I have been talking about are well known for all of them. But I have tried to, to make a lecture open to everyone and try to to open windows to the people to, to see different things in their in the day-to-day -day life regarding material science. So thank you very much and I am open to receive your questions by email or by directly, you know, me, by, by, by WhatsApp or any other way. And please do it if you need and uh, you want to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose Manuel. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye to everyone. Thank you.